So today, I'm going to be going back and recapping things that we discovered back in chapter 1 of the book of John. Um, along with 29 life lessons that was presented during that time, so it's going to go pretty quick. Uh, we gained some incredible insight as we watched Jesus in action, and as, as we saw him preparing to even to, to come to visit us on this planet. We saw who, who Jesus really is, why he came. We understand more about the world he came into from these scriptures. We've seen that although he always acted with grace, truth, love, and compassion, that he was also hated by the very people who have, uh, should have been honoring him the most. We've also seen the reliability of the Bible, how it's always true, and how it's truly the word of God that he has gifted to us. And we've learned that uh, even a casual reading of John can actually change a person's life forever. We encourage people to, to read it. One of the first books we encourage people to read when they first open a Bible. But then by studying even deeper, we found so many cool things that we miss when we simply just read through the gospel. So here goes John chapter one, verses one to three. I will read some of these. I won't read all of them, but you can kind of follow through that the, the chapter as, as we go through. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So we start out with an eyewitness to the very beginning of the universe. And He chose to tell us about it. Just like in Genesis chapter 1, we read a very similar opening line. But here, it's focused more on God's Word. Jesus is called the Word of God as the book of John begins. And, and this clearly means a divine expression or divine communication, the Word. And we find that um, there's the good news here is that there is no reason to doubt the Word of God. Jesus or Jesus in print, so to speak. Uh, he was there at creation and every we have every reason to doubt others, mere men, who are sometimes falsely and sometimes in the name of, name of science, making up theories and about how things started and who was there and what happened. Uh, but these, these men were never there and they never saw anybody that was there. They don't believe anybody that was there that gave the story. So we, we see um, that God was there, an eyewitness to creation. And our life, first life lesson is Jesus is God, the revelation of God himself to mankind. Jesus is God, the revelation of God himself to mankind. Now some will say, I don't believe that God is real unless he shows himself to me. Guess what? He did. <laughs> he came. He taught God's ways. He did miracles in front of both his followers and in front of those who hated him. And he did so much more. And, and much of it was written down by a number of eyewitnesses that show us that God was absolutely real. Uh, Jesus was the only figure in history that was 100% man, and at the same time, 100% God. Uh, Jesus clearly claimed divinity many times. Each time he said, I am. That was the claim to be God, and also, I and the Father are one. So there's no doubt there. So our life lesson from these things are that is that Jesus was, Jesus the Christ was and is God. Foundational truth. Jesus the Christ was and is God. Now what else? Well, the Bible speaks truth. It has never changed trying to match the trends in society as it was, since it was given to mankind. There are truths about life and death, about the intents and the attitudes of the hearts of all people, uh, how our race began, how our one race, Adam's race, one blood, also known as humans, and that's the only race there is. We hear about racial issues. The only issue in race is that there is only one. And I heard someone put it uh, very clearly, our problem is not skin, our problem is sin. And the Bible talks about our primary problem is sin, and the one and only solution to that problem, and that is Jesus' love and forgiveness for everyone who receives him into their lives. The Bible has always been right and always will be right. 
our life lesson that we learned as reading through this is that we can trust the Bible above all else. We can trust the Bible above all else. Now, the foundation was also established for four important truths about Jesus. One, in him was life and the power to bestow life. Two, that life was the light of men, or is the light of men, too. Three, the light shines on in the darkness. And four, the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it and, and sometimes is unreceptive to that light. As we travel through John, 38 times the word life is mentioned. And we see how God intended for us to have eternal life. And yet we know that man's rebellion back in the Garden of Eden and since then has brought us death. Now this book of John shows us how God kept his promise to restore us to the full life that he originally had intended for us. And he lets us choose that life. The next uh, teaching we learned about the forerunner of the Messiah that was prophesied in the Hebrew Scriptures. We dug into the other accounts to find the beginnings of John the Baptizer. Um, our brother David loves to say John the Immerser. I mean, that's what baptize means, is to immerse in water. But not only do we find the details about John being born, but also that given the supernatural events surrounding his birth, that John could have only been sent by God. We found out the blessings and the purposes, purposes, multiple purposes of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Something that formerly happened only at rare times and sometimes hundreds of years apart from each other. But here we found it happened at least three times within three months to three seemingly plain and ordinary people, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit and that was confirming the miraculous events that were taking place in the birth of John. So our life lesson is that God now uses ordinary people to do amazing things. God now uses ordinary people to do amazing things. We discovered that the Holy Spirit filling your life is not something to, to think, up as, think of as weird. I mean, that's despite something you may have seen on TV or, or maybe been in a meeting sometime where strange things happen and they said, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. And I would be very wary of any activities attributed to the Holy Spirit that are not spelled out in the Bible. The Bible is very clear about many things. We, we know that not everything that people claim is from God really is from God. And not everything people claim is of the Holy Spirit really is of the Holy Spirit. But the scriptures are very clear. We studied several reasons why the Holy Spirit fills us and how to discern the, the moving of the Holy Spirit and the activities that, that he brings us into. So it's very important to, to understand these things about the Holy Spirit. And John the baptizer was one that had a rugged life. He, he eked out a, an existence out in the desert lands. Uh, yet his life and his ministry, what happened with him, was prophesied by Isaiah and used by God to be, as Isaiah put it, a one voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. One of the things we learned from seeing John the Baptizer's life is a life lesson for us, and that is the Lord uses tragic events in our lives to help out many others to find the light and the love of Jesus Christ. The Lord uses tragic events in our lives to help many others find the light and love of Jesus Christ. Now, we got two Johns, so I gotta determine which one is which. In, in the eyewitness account, John, the gospel writer, gives us names, uh, gives us locations, even gives us dates. Um, you know, who reigned and what year, and, you know, what year of this particular ruler was something happened. And these are things that we can research and we can confirm the accuracy and reliability of the scripture and of the accounts that John is giving here. Now, in addition, we don't find any records, absolutely no records of anyone disputing these writings during the lifetime of John and really many years beyond his lifetime. Why don't we see that? I mean, today people, oh, the Bible's not true, it was made up, but we don't see 
we don't see during that, that, those time periods because people knew it was true. They were eyewitnesses there. They would look like, if, like fools if they said, oh no, no, that didn't actually happen because 50 people around, yeah, I saw that happen. So we, we know that's, that's true. And something interesting uh, we learned from John the Baptizer is that although he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't know everything. You know, just being filled with the Holy Spirit, having God living in your, your heart, does not make you know the totality of God's uh, every move. And even in your own life, we know that John did not know the totality of God's mission for him or even who the Messiah was until the right time for it to be revealed to everybody. A life lesson here for us is that the Holy Spirit reveals truth to us as we need to know it. Not too soon, but not too late. The Holy Spirit reveals truth to us as we need to know. Not too soon, not too late. Uh, as we continued in the, in the teachings, we, we learned about light and darkness. Uh, as part of that, we found out that when we deny the good things of God by not practicing them, maybe not uh, taking advantage of having the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we lose the power of God in our lives. We lose our children. We might lose their children. We might lose society. Y'all see that happening here? Society now calls bad things good. They label the truth of God as lies. They lift up evil as acceptable and, and desirable. And, and even now, they expect us all to take pride in, in evil practices. This, brothers and sisters, is called darkness. Okay? But this can be fixed, but only through Jesus. In talking about Jesus, uh, John 1, 9-14 9 says, That was the true light, which gives, every, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that the very nature of light causes the darkness to flee. And once that light shines in our lives, on our own selfish deeds and our rebellion against God, we have a choice. We can either embrace the light or we can run from it and reject the light of Christ. And thus going further away from the light, falling into deeper darkness. A life lesson from this is to live your life in the light of Jesus. Live your life in the light of Jesus. Not only this, but, but our association with Jesus imparts that light to us. Others will actually be affected by his light shining through us to them. So another life lesson is when you live your life in the light of Jesus, others will notice it. When you live your life in the light of Jesus, others will notice it. Uh, we also took note of one little word in that passage I just read, we studied the meaning of the true light. It talks about true light. Well, that helps us understand that there must also be false lights. Have you ever heard an, an untrue or misleading portrayal of somebody? Well, no, no, of course not. You haven't. I have. Have you ever forwarded a story or retold a story or sent a picture of somebody or, or maybe a politician? that you really hadn't checked out, but you thought it sounded good, at least for your side, but then you found out it wasn't really true. Now, those are false lights, okay? And as believers in the true light, we simply cannot be the light if we intentionally reflect falsehoods, okay? Very convicting sometimes. We must not pass along false information without confirming things that can't be backed up by true witnesses or by the Word of God. So our lesson from, from that uh, teaching is that 
We must let our life reflect the true light of Christ Jesus and the Bible. Let your life reflect the true light of Christ Jesus and the Bible. Now, we are also encouraged um, in sharing with others about Jesus that while nobody likes to be rejected when they speak to others, the gospel is actually a mystery to others, and at first it doesn't seem to make sense to them, especially unconverted people. Uh, but with our prayers that are for, the lost, for lost people, with the Holy Spirit, His power guiding in our lives and our thoughts, letting Him control our speech, and then with the Heavenly Father drawing people to Jesus, God can open the eyes of the blind, so to speak, so that they can see His light. Brothers and sisters, that's why prayer, that's why fellowship, that's why allowing God to work through you is so very important. And once that heavenly light is turned on and seen, guess what? The truth overcomes the mystery of the gospel in, in, the, in the, the listener's mind and heart, and there's nothing that stands in the way of people responding to receive God's word from your lips. And we are the only thing that God has sent out into the world to proclaim his word. So our life lesson is allow the Holy Spirit to speak God's word through you to help others know Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you to help others know Jesus. Now, people may still reject your message. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there's even Adam and Eve. They fellowship with God in person day after day. And they ended up listening to the lies of the enemy about the consequences of their disobedience. And they listened to half-truths about how good it would be. You know, Eve bought the lie. Eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened like God's. Well, that was half-truth, but it wasn't totally true. Uh, but Eve bought the lie. She sold that lie to her husband. They disobeyed God, and the rest, as they say, is history literally the history of mankind. So check things out, and our life lesson is always choose the greater good. Obey God. Always choose the greater good. Obey God. Now obviously, since Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden, uh, we've all inherited that sin and death in our lives and, and all around us, but the book of God tells us how to get back that eternal life that God fulfilled life that was lost. And it is by believing in and fully embracing Jesus. And we read that verse in uh, John 1, 12, and in Amplified, I like the way it, it explains it. It says, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. Simple life lesson from that is adhere to, trust in, and rely on the name of Jesus the Christ. Adhere to, trust in, and rely on the name of Jesus the Christ. As we continued, we explored the processes that, uh, that take place when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We also reviewed some of the biblical terms, the terms the Bible uses for, for that happening in your life, such as being saved, uh, being born again, born of the Spirit, the new birth, and, and other terminology. But no matter what term you use, it's a new life and we need to grow in it. So our next life lesson became this one, constantly feed on the Word of God. That's how you grow, constantly feed on the Word of God. Now, we discussed many of the things that happen as a result of our new life, the eternal life God gives us. Uh, these are things that don't earn you that life by doing them, but because we've been given that gift, that free gift of eternal life, these are things that, um, you know, we, we know we will go to heaven, and these are things we want to do, like coming to church. You guys have a great head start on that today. Come to church for learning and for fellowship, loving and serving others, praying, having open communication with God, reading the Bible and studying the Bible, hopefully on a daily basis, being baptized, 
in obedience to God, living your life in a way that pleases God, telling others about Jesus Christ, and, and so many other things that become blessings to God, to ourselves, and I mean, to others, and, and to ourselves as well. So as you do these things, once you've grown and matured by, by drinking what the Bible calls the milk of the word every day, then you begin to grasp the deeper truths of God, the meat of the word of God. And we see that as we're, as we're studying in John, again, there's just such a wonderful book that God's given us. A person that's never read, never known anything about Jesus or the Bible or God can pick up the book of John and come to have that eternal life in their hearts and lives just by simply reading through it and letting God talk to them. But on the other hand, someone that's been a Christian for 60, 70 years can still go through, dig in, and find more meaty stuff in that same, those same words as we dig in. So um, what's, what is sad to see is that someone trying to run with the meatier things, the, you know, really some things that take a lot of studying out, a lot of those meaty things in the Bible, uh, when they haven't even been drinking the milk of the word, um, the basics that are needed to sustain life. Uh, even worse is though, those that don't even, have not even believed in Jesus, trusted in him, relied on him, adhered to him, you know, committed their life to him, and yet they're trying to understand the difficult things or the, the deeper things in the Bible. But brothers and sisters, we need to help encourage people when, when they uh, bring up things that are maybe on the deeper side but their life has not been turned over to Jesus yet to start with, we need to encourage them to get their life right with God to start with, to accept Jesus, let him and his spirit begin to reveal the truths of God to their, their hearts. We also uh, asked, why did the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-perfect God, why did he have to lower himself to live in a weak, limited, and frail human body that's far from perfect? And then I realized, he didn't have to. He wanted to. God took on human flesh. It says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here are some of the, the benefits of God taking on human flesh. He, God took on human flesh to overcome the power of, of death. He did it to help us with temptation and suffering. He did it to provide a way to discern truth. He did it to, to set an example for us of how we can obey God. He did it to show that we could overcome sin by His Spirit, even though we are weak in the flesh. He did it to carry our load of sin for us. He did it to bleed and die for our forgiveness and to relate to us right where we are as a human. So as we continue studying, we, we circle back the importance of John the Baptizer's ministry. It was mentioned, uh, came back again. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about how John's father was a Jewish priest. Sure, John also studied the scriptures. He realized how far people had strayed from God by, by really understanding the scriptures. And honestly, John preached boldly that everyone from the lowest peasant to the rulers and kings needed to repent from evil and prepare their hearts for the kingdom of God. What happened? Multitudes of people repented, turned from their sins. However, there were still some that persisted in their evil. And even some of the powerful ones wanted John out of the picture. But we also see that this was not going to happen until John's God-given mission had been accomplished. So a life lesson for us here, it's wonderful, is God has an incredible plan for your life and will be with you and sustain you to accomplish his purpose through you. God has an incredible plan for your life and will be with you and sustain you to accomplish his purpose through you. I often think of the blessings that God's given me. There are some, several events in my life when I just said, you know, God take me now because it can't get any better than this. But I know he's still got a purpose because I still have a heartbeat. <laughs> if you still have a heartbeat, God still has a purpose for you in your life, and he'll continue to work through you. We also had a revealing contrast as, as a, of the law that Moses gave and grace, as well as 
where they were blended in the presence of Jesus. As the scripture says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, our life lesson in, in this section is that God's grace is unlimited and is available in our lives. God's grace is unlimited and is available in our lives. John 1, 16 and 17 intentionally compared the law that God brought through a man, Moses, and compared that against what God himself brought in person through Jesus. Now, God's grace is so much deeper than the law, it just could not be portrayed by giving words or commands to a person to pass along. So it had to be God in the person of Jesus to show us these things. This is what we wanna share with others. So our life lesson is that as we grow in God's grace, every day of our lives, his grace will overflow to others. As we grow in God's grace every day of our lives, his grace will overflow to others. In our next teaching, we saw that uh, John the baptizer was preaching a brutally honest message. You know, you ever know brutally honest people? Uh, but he had a brutally honest message of, of repentance, pointing to the kingdom of God. And, and we saw that the religious leaders of the day were trying to find out what this guy was all about. And at first, it seemed to be an honest quest for the truth, asking sincere questions. And this is something we can learn from. Our life lesson is the, to seek out the truth of God at the source of truth. Ask God. Read God's word. Seek godly counsel. Seek out the truth of God at the source of truth. Ask God directly. Read God's word and seek godly counsel. Now, what's really cool is we see a lot of clarifications and a lot of fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. What question they had for John indicated they thought that he might be the reincarnation of the prophet Elijah, right? Then are you Elijah? But they had misinterpreted Malachi's prophecy of when Elijah, who never has died yet, but when Elijah will appear in the end times. Yes, God did grant them a glimpse of the Holy Spirit that was working through that incredible prophet. In fact, uh, when the angel came to Zacharias uh, before announcing the birth of John the Baptist, he, the, the angel told his father, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. But he didn't say he was going to be Elijah reincarnated. So this, this, this helps us out understand it very clearly in our life lesson, it is appointed unto man once to die. Reincarnation is a myth. Our life here and now is what matters and will determine our eternal destination. It is appointed unto man once to die. Reincarnation is a myth. Our life here and now is what matters and will determine our eternal destination. So the power of John's message was simple. It was one given back in the Garden of Eden. What was the message God gave to, to Adam and Eve? Obey God. Enjoy life, walk with me and obey, you know, just listen to what I tell you. Now, the other, the other part of that is that John's message is if you've drifted away, turn back, come back to God. So our life lesson is obeying God brings his righteousness into our lives. Live out God's word in your life. Obeying God brings his righteousness into our lives. Live out God's word in your life. So uh, then we continue. John also set a standard of humility that we are wise to emulate today. He said, one of his statements is, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. There's a lot in there, but our life lesson we, we, we pulled from that is that when we're telling others about Jesus, as, as John did, our life lesson is in witnessing, minimize yourself. Instead, focus on Jesus and his infinite goodness and authority. In witnessing, minimize yourself. Instead, focus on Jesus and his infinite goodness and authority. And something else that stands out during John's ministry is that despite all the supernatural signs that surrounded his birth, 
the, sprung, the birth and the early life of Jesus just a few years earlier, the religious leaders didn't acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah. So John had to point him out to them. So our, they were told over and over, they, there was, you know, you, you know all the things around Jesus' birth, the angels, the, the prophecies that came beforehand, the wise men that traveled from, you know, a, a long distance to get there, Simeon there in the temple saying, this is the Messiah. All of these things and, and the timing, the pointing out of uh, the scriptures that pointed to the, to the day, pretty much the day that Jesus would be born, all of those things. And yet they didn't recognize it. Our life lesson is pretty simple. I could have said, don't be dumb, but that's, that wouldn't be nice. So the life lesson is, when God, keep, when God keeps telling you something over and over, pay attention and act on it. When God keeps telling you something over and over, pay attention and act on it. John also made it clear that Jesus would somehow fulfill all of the law that had previously only covered up sin and he would actually completely remove that sin not just covered up and the scripture is there and John says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world not just covers it up takes it away so our life lesson is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the blood of Jesus Christ provides cleansing and forgiveness for our sin the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, provides cleansing and forgiveness for our sin. Now soon afterwards, it says, John bore witness, saying, I saw a spirit, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this, Jesus, is the Son of God. Our life lesson through this witness is that you can know, really know beyond a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who takes away all of your sin and will change your life completely. You can know, really know beyond a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who takes away all of your sin and will change your life completely. And as we continue teaching through, we, we soon see that John the Baptist was not seeking his own glory at all. His followers had, had heard John filled with the Spirit, the Spirit-filled prophet they'd heard many times, and they knew enough that they should follow the Messiah once they found him. And we soon see that happening. The scripture says, And looking at Jesus, as he, John, walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So again, when we tell others, like John did, when telling others about Jesus, let the Holy Spirit use you to prepare their hearts to see Jesus. Life lesson again, when telling others about Jesus, let the Holy Spirit use you to help prepare their hearts to see and to follow Jesus. Now John the baptizer simply followed the directions that God gave him through the Holy Spirit and witness to others about what he had seen and heard concerning Jesus Christ. That started a chain of events, started a chain of conversions, one telling another, one seeing another, the Holy Spirit, and, you know, drawing someone to him. And it's happened over and over for the last 1990 years. And that's what's led each one of us today to be pointed to Jesus Christ. It's pretty awesome. Just ordinary people in that whole chain. Our life lesson is that God uses ordinary people like me and you to do extraordinary things. God uses ordinary people like me and you to do extraordinary things. You know, we see John's witness in action. You know, let's look, look at some of the, we looked at some of the people that, that were affected. John's witness in action, he pointed and told two men, there he is. And they follow Jesus. How often do you take an opportunity to, to point others to Jesus? I hope you do it a lot. Encourage them as they need it. But let them, let them make that decision to follow Jesus. We can't beat it into them. And we see John didn't beat it into them. He just said, there he is. And they follow. 
Then we see Andrew, one of those two, went, he found his brother Simon and told him he found the Messiah. He physically brought him to meet Jesus face to face. But it wasn't right away. It took a little while before Peter really started following Jesus. That happens with some people. You introduce them to the Lord, it takes them a while to catch on and to really follow Jesus. Then we see Philip in there, uh, in that same, same uh, next pa part of the passage. Philip was called directly by Jesus to follow him. He was walking down the, the path, saw Philip and follow me. Right away, Philip understood the call and jumped at the chance to follow Jesus. He understood it. Our life lesson for us is that Jesus is calling to us to follow him. Follow Jesus. Jesus is calling to you to follow Jesus, to follow him. So follow Jesus. Now, in, in this uh, number of people that we see coming to the Lord, there was Nathaniel. He's one of my favorites now. Okay? He's an interesting guy. He seems quite skeptical at first, if you read through that story, but then um, almost sarcastic. But then something, maybe that's how I can, why I can relate to him, right? I'm a little sarcastic myself sometimes. But then something seemingly insignificantly, insignificant totally changed Nathaniel's or Nate's attitude. I love studying, studying out what happened in Nathaniel. And if you haven't fully heard the teaching, I, I encourage you to check it out on YouTube. Um, we rediscovered during that study that every verse, every word in the Bible is put there for a reason. There is no filler. All the words in the Bible are very important. They're key pieces to what you might consider a, a complex jigsaw puzzle. Now you and I would probably not even have seen how this works if we didn't have an account of Nathaniel's uh, previous studies and understanding that a simple word that Jesus said totally changed Nathaniel's life forever. Our life lesson that we get from this and seeing Nathaniel because he studied is when life gets hard and even when it's not, take time in a quiet place to pray, study, and meditate on God's Word. That's what Nathaniel did. When life gets hard, and even when it's not, take time in a quiet place to pray, study, and meditate on God's Word. Now, as we look back at how all of these men began to seriously follow Jesus, we discovered another important truth. So our life lesson is that God uses many different people and many different circumstances to bring people to Himself. Let him use you, and then let him change their lives. God uses many different people and many different circumstances to bring people to himself. Let him use you, and then let him change their lives. You know, I want to encourage you. You probably are doing this, but I can always want to encourage you even more to, to get to know God's word the way as intimately as Nathaniel did, so that when Jesus speaks to you, the lights will come on, both in your heart and your mind and your life, and you'll have an incredible life-changing experience. Every day can be a new adventure when that happens in your life. Now, it's in the conversion, in the conversation, excuse me, with Jesus, we find uh, Jesus' first use of a phrase that we see a lot in the Gospel of John. And we see different forms of it in different versions. In, in New King James, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, it appears 25 times in the gospel. You also see it in King James, I think it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. But it, it's literally, Amen, Amen, in the Hebrew. And its meaning is, Listen up, y'all. This is really, really important. And it's a great truth. So you want to take notes. So whenever you see that in Scripture, that's what you want to do. And the, another phrase that he uses over 80 times in the Gospel that was introduced in this conversation, he talked about the Son of Man. Now the people that Jesus talked to, that can be confusing for us here in our day. But the people that Jesus was talking to always did understand that when he said Son of Man, he was claiming to be God in the flesh, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, and he was on a mission on earth as a man. And that was based in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. So that's a scripture, uh, you may want to look it up, that, that tells people that this Messiah, messenger, son of God, would be 
called the Son of Man. Now, there's no question that Jesus spoke of the, uh, that spoke of the Messiah, Jesus, and I think he probably also would like to refer to himself as the Son of Man to, to actually cause us to think about it just a little deeper. What's that mean? And that help us to dig out and find out. And finally, in finishing up chapter 1, Jesus said, Hereafter you shall see the heaven, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, this, he was talking to Nathaniel and Philip, and there was others around, but he was actually talking to all of us who truly follow Jesus. Like so many things in the book of John, multiple meanings abound. No matter which meaning you take, you know he's speaking of supernatural events. The Apostle John actually supposed the world could not contain the books that could be written about the many things that Jesus said and did while he was still on the planet. In the body, when the disciples saw the miracles that Jesus performed, it would have seemed like angels were coming and going and bringing down heaven uh, to, to the common things all around them. Even today, we see glimpses of, of God and, and the glorious workings in our lives and others. So many good things we experience are not simple coincidences. They're orchestrated by God in heaven. And miraculous blessings come through Jesus into our lives by some many times put together by unseen angels all around us. We don't worship the angels, we worship God and thank him for that. But you know, our life lesson here is to watch for miracles as Jesus works in people and circumstances all around you and give God all the glory. Watch for miracles as Jesus works in people and circumstances all around you and give God the glory. Now, I love how the Bible opens up the heavens for a few minutes. We see awesome things and and then it brings us right back down to where we live. So we're back. <laughs> I, I hope this recap of some of these things we learned in the first chapter of John has is, is opened up your minds and your hearts uh, and understanding and kind of reminded you of, of things, uh, especially of how much God loves you. And he gives us one great truth after another that we can apply to our lives as we look in his word. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. If you need prayer, just let us know. I'm glad to pray with you, pray for you. And I want to ask the Lord's blessing on you as we close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>